grateful to be here with this fabulous panel. Thanks to all of you for braving the uh, deluge of, of the uh, end of the summer here in New York and joining us for, for today's panel. The topic that we're going to discuss today is an interesting one and one in which um, we continue to be a little bit vexed in the, in the banking industry by a bunch of folks that are not part of the larger process. And we want to talk a little bit today about this familiar topic, but we, we have a, a range of perspectives here on how unbanked and underbanked issues um, have come to be where they are today, on, on where they're going, and on some innovative solutions to try and address the gaps that we see in the marketplace. And so I'm very much looking forward to this panel. I want to thank each and every one of our panelists for joining us. And as we talk about this issue today, I guess we recognize that um, having folks on the underbanked or unbanked has a, a way of isolating them from certain mainstream e economic activity and um, has some opportunity costs for, for that population. Um, we've seen lots of efforts to try and reach unbanked and underbanked populations, uh, but uh, to some extent we have continued to see a fairly a substantial portion of the population that remains in this category. So turning to you, Aaron, in the first instance to talk a little bit about how we should understand this and, and what it means and almost to level set for us definitionally, could you tell us a little bit about how, you, how we should understand what unbanked and underbanked means and why it's important we're talking about it today? Yeah, thank you very much. I think it's incredibly important to have this foundational uh, conversation to start with because people use these terms synonymously when there's actually no overlap between the two groups. Definitional, <coughs> right? If you are unbanked, the FDIC, which is kind of the gold standard survey in this space, says that there's nobody in your household who has a bank. That is true for about one out of every 20 U.S. households. They don't define that individually. So you may not have a bank account, but your spouse or partner may. You may be a 19-year-old adult living at home without an account, but your parent does, so you would be considered bank. It means you're a home that doesn't have a bank account. That number's gone down. It used to be closer to 1 in 11, 9% to about 5% over time. There's been a, a sharp decrease. So 19 out of 20 households in America are banked. Among the people who are banked, though, about 1 in 6 are considered underbanked. Definitionally, underbanked means that somebody in your household over the course of the last year used either a check casher, payday lender, or wire transmitter for a financial service. So they sent money overseas to Western Union. Uh, my mom actually did that uh, uh, to, to handle an account she has in France. So she would technically be considered underbanked, which would be somewhat laughable for. Uh, an 86-year-old woman in, in Bethesda, uh, <laughs> but uh, Maryland, but definitionally, that's it. My own research has shown that 70% of people at a check cashing store have a bank account. All of those people are underbanked, that's 70%. The other 30% are unbanked. Now, this doesn't, the underbank doesn't count the one in 12 Americans who have 10 or more overdrafts a year. One of my favorite and most frustrating conversations is when people go, I want, to, I want to solve problems for the underbanked, for the unbanked, like overdraft <laughs> or payday lending. Every single payday loan is made to a person with a bank account by definition. There's no other way you can give someone a post-dated check other than have your account. Why are people unbanked? People are unbanked for one set of reasons. People are underbanked for another set of reasons, but they're very different households with very different sets of needs and financial. I would postulate that by the broader definition of un underbanked, which would include heavy overdraft users, other alternative financial providers, may not, maybe not everybody uses a wire transmitter service, you may be as high as up to one in four Americans. And depending on how you define unbanked, it could be a bit larger, but it is dwarfed by the number of people who are underbanked. Thanks for setting the table in that way. It's important to have the definitions right. And Janice, I think I'll turn to you to talk a little bit about the dimension of 
who is in these demographics, right? Who, who are these populations we are talking about? We know that there are disparities, that there are some educational disparities, there are some regional concentrations. Um, we, we know that there is a multiple of African Americans and, and Latinx folks that, that are unbanked. I, I think both unbanked and underbanked, although I'm sure I'll be corrected if I have that wrong. Um, so from your perspective and based on, on your experience, how is it that we should be thinking about these demographic disparities and um, why is that an issue that we should be concerned about? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, oh, can you guys hear me? Is my mic okay? Oh, okay. Um, so within that one in 20 that, that Aaron mentioned, the, the ratio is much, much higher in communities of color, probably five times as great amongst black households and similar numbers for Latinx households. And there are a number of structural inequities that underpin the relationship of people of color to their financial institutions. Of course, I'm, I'm going to assume a, a baseline understanding in this room of uh, kind of our, our legacy of structural racism and the way that may cut by geography or neighborhood. I assume if you're in this room, you have a basic understanding of banking deserts, um, areas that are not well served by financial institutions. So I won't repeat all of that for you. What I want you to think about and consider is the self-reinforcing circle that this creates that makes it challenging for people of color to interact with the with the financial system. You have the legacy of the racial wealth gap and income dis disparities that make it uh, more expensive uh, to, um, in order to even get bank accounts to withstand financial shocks. Um, so that plays out in things like overdraft fees, which lead people to not want to have those bank accounts, and they either drop out of the banking system or they end up with dormant accounts and they, they become the, the underbanked. Um, the, uh, the lack of trust, which we frequently see cited as, as a reason, both financial institutions will report that that's what they hear and we see this in the FDIC survey. Um, it, it comes from the experience that people have with financial institutions that are not meeting fundamental needs. Let's assume for a moment that people, uh, that consumers out there, lower income consumers, people of color, those that have had different experiences with financial <coughs> institutions, they're fundamentally rational actors. They're making choices to go to payday lenders and alternative financial services. It's not because they don't know that those things are pricey necessarily, it's because they're not getting what they need in one way or another from their financial institution, whether that is rapid access to cash, uh, the ability to control their spending, uh, and so on. So we can talk more about those things, but I want, in addition to the structural things you're probably familiar, I want you to think about the way these things become self-reinforcing to create an experience that makes it really challenging for um, those that are highly concentrated in the unbanked and underbanked to access the financial services that they need that are going to jumpstart broader uh, economic participation. Pick, picking up on that important point of the extent to which this becomes self-reinforcing, even, even for those of us who have an understanding of the history and that path, it is pretty remarkable that the, that the degree um, of the disparity is, is so sticky, right? And so I'm, I'm just wondering to the, to the whole panel, it, should we be surprised that this many years on, there are lending laws, all sorts of enforcement, federal and, and local agencies, that we still have the disparities that we're talking about today? Should we be surprised by that or, or not really? No, no. So let's take a real world problem, right? Friday, September 30th, you have a check in your hand for a week's worth of work. Your bills are getting deducted out of your balance Saturday, October 1. You got paid at the end of the day. What do you do? Check cashers, 20 bucks to turn that into cash. You can deposit it in your bank and wait for the money to be available on Tuesday. Why does the money take Tuesday? You can take a picture of it on your phone or you can go to the ATM. I wrote the law, helped write the law on the Hill, the Check 21 Act that allowed us to take the pictures. Does the money get there any faster? No. Has the Fed improved things? No. 
Is the problem just as bad as it was before? Yes. It is, it is pedantic and insulting to give somebody a financial literacy brochure for how to solve the problem. When in point of fact, as Counselor Bowler made clear, the person is doing the smartest thing they can. It's 20 bucks at the check cashier and it's $35 per overdraft. There's also um, you know, not just the, the transfer of payments, which is a huge problem, but there are things that happen at the branch or online level when people try to open accounts that are continuously denying them. Um, you know, we have um, address issues, you know, defining a permanent address. Um, there are people who are transient, especially right now with the way that rent um, and you know, the foreclosure uh, uptick is beginning already. So there are people without permanent addresses who are not going to be eligible considering for an account. There are people who don't have IDs that are accepted. Um, that's a huge problem. We have bank on coalitions um, sort of in the, in the far west in tribal areas where their IDs are, are often not accepted by financial institutions. Um, and then of course the big thing, and Aaron and I have, have talked about this on and off for the last year or so, um, you know, the pre-screening systems, um, whether it's you know, check systems or early warning systems or whatever it is, there are people who, whose accounts go dormant um, or who have overdrafted and have a balance of 200, which um, sometimes becomes much more than $200, and then they're denied opening an account. So, uh, to answer your question very directly, we have, we have made it hard. We have made something uh, that should be and could be very easy much harder. And there's you know, one thing that I think everybody in the room is very aware of, uh, you know, something that the fintech companies, who are, who are not banks themselves, have started to solve um, to make it easy to open accounts. Um, yeah. Oh, you haven't well, uh, spoken yet. Go ahead. Well, so there's a balance there, right? And, and you know, during the pandemic, right, there's all this discussion about fintech lenders had done all this great work to bring in, you know, they, they kind of captured the banner of financial inclusion um, to the bank session. Um, and we got to the point where, as we discussed later on, like we had folks like even the New York Times calling for replacing the bank. It's like, gosh, we have got to get this out to the public more quickly. And yet, lo and behold, right, we come back and we realize if you tally up who were the fraudulent lenders during the pandemic, 19 out of the top 20 fraudulent lenders were Right, the 20th, by the way, is a community bank, so our DEI, our TCH members, so it's safe to say that here. Uh, <laughs> but but, but that's, that's what we run into, right? There are trade-offs to be had there. Um, you know, I, I do think that banks get it, right? I, you know, I, when we, we puzzle at this question of the unbanked, as Aaron put it, right? The people that have bank accounts yet still use alternative financial services. Right? The CFPB, Scott Fulford, did a kind of remarkable study that said, gosh, if you look at people that use like alternative credit sources, a huge number of them, as much as like 33%, had open lines of credit on credit cards that were much better for them, right? Why is that? I think it's a couple of things. Um, you know, I think, as some of the other panelists mentioned, there is the question of volatility and being able to understand kind of like the sense of menu type pricing. Uh, Lisa Servan, as many of you probably know, is a professor at University of Pennsylvania. Um, she actually worked at a payday lender. She worked at a check cashier to try to understand what would motivate the unbanked. And she said, well, golly, in those cases, you have people that like, they see the menu pricing up front, right? And as Aaron noted, they, right, they can say, I, I'm going to pay 20 bucks now rather than have the surprise of a $35 overdraft fee. And what I would note is that the banks, I think, are getting it, right? So, um, you know, not, not even 10 years ago, Michael Barr wrote a book about financial inclusion, and he said, gosh, we should promote digital access, no minimum balance, um, no overdraft checking accounts. I'm like, I'm proud to say that there's at least one financial institution that does that, and I think that there are more that are moving in that direction. Um, the other thing that I'd say, though, and this is why I get fired up, I apologize, but, but the other thing I'd say about that, though, is that Michael Barr also noted that the proximity, like having a bank branch nearby didn't move the needle on whether you were banked or not, right? Whether or not you use alternative financial services. The, per like the only indicator as to whether or not you use alternative financial services is whether or not the alternative financial services provider was physically close to you, right? And so in my mind, like, there is a kind of equal regulation question there as well, right? Like if, if you squeeze just one side of the two toothpaste, like, like you're going to push people in that direction. And what we're seeing, right, is that like, you can't do any, like, like that. You can't, there's, there's so much you can do on the bank side but like, work needs to be done on the non-bank side, and I think that's one of the themes that we're seeing in today's conversation, right? It's how do we do that 
and, and quite frankly not let them bring all kinds of harm to consumers under the name of financial inclusion. Yeah, to be clear, I'm not stumping for the FinTech app. And in fact, no bank on, um, in bank on, we only certify uh, financial institutions that are chartered and, and you know, federally insured. Janice, I think you wanted to get in on this. Yeah, I was, uh, I'll mention two things. So one is, um, David, your point on people's experience with check systems. I would just underscore that this is um, a good example of what I mean on the circular nature, where your own income fragility or living to paycheck to paycheck um, sort of ironically can bump you out of the banking system maybe at the time that you need it the most. And so, the, and then that experience leads to people saying, this, this just isn't for me, or I just can't afford it, even though if you hand them the financial literacy pamphlet, it looks like on paper one is maybe priced differently, but in fact the, the transparency predictability is, is part of what people go for. The other thing I wanted to mention about the um, about the technological changes, there's probably a lot for us to talk about here, but in this room, again, I want to challenge you to think about as the, um, as the financial system drives to efficiency to serve a certain set of cons customers and lowers the price to serve those customers, it inadvertently makes it more expensive to serve other customers. So where you are now doing things much more like remote capture, um, more by ATM, it's more expensive to serve people one-to-one, -to, -one, um, to have uh, live call centers. And so it's something for all of us to think about the way that might show up in pricing or in staffing. Um, and that then has an impact on the experience that your lower income customers may be having. So in addition to the, um, the legacy of structural racism and the perception that people have and the direct lived experience people have had, there are these subtle changes that say to people whether or not they belong in a certain place. And if you were used to being able to go in and cash a check with a teller and now that's all remote capture and you don't have that technology available to you for whatever reason, that it just starts to skew the experience that people have. Yeah, but I mean, building on that point, right, it, it wasn't even subtle, right? No overdraft costs any institution $35. That's not the cost of the service. The, the fee was punitive. It was purposefully punitive to discourage people from overdrafting. Okay, you want to discourage people from overdrafting? Don't let them. Once you realize that you had a captive group of people, in part because they didn't know when their money was coming and they didn't know when their money was going, it became a giant source of fun. The number one reason people leave the bank or unbank cost about fifty percent. Right? It's a little higher when you add in fee, uh, unexpected fees and other things. No minimum about no minimum ten dollars a month if you have more than a thousand bucks in your account. Right? We we have this system structurally set up that way as a reverse Robin Hood. And we should acknowledge it. Some institutions have done more of acknowledging that structure than others. And look, we have a reverse Robin Hood all throughout different aspects. All of our credit card reward points are being funded to us on the basis of people using cash and debit. All those people didn't qualify and had lower funds, right? So we have a set of reverse Robin Hood systems. And let's not pretend when it comes to pricing for the lowest income people that that has to be priced based on cost. When in point of fact, you've used the income stream from those folks to subsidize a bunch of other products for quite a while. I just, when I hear interchange, I just have to like put a marker down. And we, we can save this for another panel. I will note that merchants don't lower prices when they get lower interchange fees, right? So Fed Richmond found that I think only one and a half percent of merchants surveyed said that they lowered prices. 20% actually raised prices when they got lower interchange fees. And interchange is a, like the majority of subprime spend in America, as the CBB has shown, is on reward bearing cards. But, but I, Aaron and I are, are friends and neighbors, and we're happy to take this one offline. <laughs> so I just, I just had to, I want, I, I've got a couple of bosses out here, too. I got to make sure I've got to put the, put the marker out. So, so we'll, we'll, we'll have prices. time for the Hatfields and McCoys uh, right. session, yeah, yeah. session later. But um, picking up on some of these important points about trust, the timing of access transparency, the, the result is, and what you're describing is that as a practical matter, and, and we've even said it's rational, 
folks opt for, very often opt for alternative <coughs> financial services. And we've talked a little bit about folks going in that direction and some of the why, but let's talk about that, right? We, we heard from Kelvin that, that the regulation is not the, not the same in, in that area, and so that's one question. But more broadly, what are the impacts on the communities that are relying on, on these services? What is the, what is the trade-off? What is the opportunity cost of doing your financial services in that zone and not being part of the larger system? Framed another way, does it matter? I mean, should we be talking about the underbank or is the system working fine because folks are making a rational choice to use the alterna alternative financial system? Well, I mean, I can start by saying, I mean, there, there are two hugely prom problematic parts of being unbanked or underbanked in the community. The first is that it's really expensive. And I know we've kind of been hitting around that. But I mean, you know, I want everybody here to think about your net income if you get paid every two weeks or, or monthly or whatever it is. 20% of that off the top gone is, is really what's happening to an unbanked household or consumer. I mean, it could be less. It could be more depending on what they do. But the pay, they pay to cash the check. They then pay for each bill that they need to pay. They have to turn that cash into a money order or an electronic payment or wire it for each one, each piece that they do. So they're losing what, and, and obviously as Aaron said, it's disproportionately affecting the lower income households who are, who are more likely to be unbanked anyway. They're the least likely to be able to afford that anyway. The second piece is that for all the financial institutions that care about bringing in customers for home loans, for car loans, for IRAs, for whatever it is, having that, that first checking account is the, is the bedrock of success. It is the building block that each of those things happen because of. Does it happen later in life for a lot of unbanked households? Absolutely. But it's, it's the start of all of that. So, on the other, so I run the Bank On program for the CFD fund. On the other side of our house, we have something called our Financial Empowerment Center model, which is where we work with city governments to create um, actual cabinet level departments, like here in New York, that focus on providing one-on-one -on -one free um, financial counseling as a public service. It's a very rubric, metric-centered, not pamphlet-based uh, financial education. Because it's not really financial education, it's actual financial counseling. And what we found is that um, people that, had, um, that established a banking relationship of some kind during that counseling process were seven times more likely to hit their savings goals. They are at least three times more likely uh, to uh, improve their credit score during that process. So every piece that financial institutions care about the most are, are met through having a safe and affordable bank account. Can I, I just want to underscore what a couple of things that David said. So the, the financial coaching model is incredibly important and is an important distinction between financial education. I won't ask this room to raise your hand on how many of you have a financial advisor but I trust all of you could avail yourselves of one if, if you needed it, if you don't have it already. Why wouldn't lower income people that are trying to stretch a dollar, why wouldn't we allow them to benefit from the same kind of personalized advice that's going to help them reach their goals? As opposed to the traditional financial education method that sort of sits you down for 12 weeks and tries to teach you about everything from opening an account to paying for your retirement. Like, just from, from a, a behavioral economics experience uh, perspective, it just doesn't, doesn't work. Coaching, that's, that's what we all get. We pay for financial advice, and we should have the same standard available to our families that, um, that need it most. And I want to throw out one other, a couple of other reasons why I think it matters so much. Um, a, few, a big one is personal safety. Um, and this, this was one of the reasons why I got into this game very early in my career, because we saw um, immigrants being targeted on payday right outside uh, check cashers. We don't hear these stories as much as we did at one point, but I do not think that's because they've gone away. Um, they were targeted for their cash. People knew that they were, they were easy prey. And so um, the muggings uh, amongst uh, immigrants were particularly high, and I think that's a huge concern as we see hate crimes going up in, uh, in our current environment. So personal safety. The other I'd say is that um, increasingly as we look to um, broaden the way that we assess people's credit, we are looking at 
things like regularity in bank accounts, rent reporting, those kinds of things. Those are big opportunities for people that might not uh, have um, like uh, credit cards or any other ways. Like if you're trying to get into the game of building some credit, it's it's sort of a, um, a catch-22. You gotta kind of have something in order to get something. And the best on-ramps that we're creating, really, you gotta have a, a bank account in order to get there. So that the on-ramp um, to your question of like, does it matter? It, it does very much, which is why it's so important that we create systems and products that really meet people where they are. Anybody else have a burning need to weigh in on this one or not all? I'll turn to Kelvin to advance the conversation. Great. So, so Kelvin, let's turn to the bank perspective again. And um, we heard that there are some presumably good reasons to, to be attracting these populations because it's a gateway to um, banking going forward and all of the different products banks offer. But could you share with us your reflections on what the business, reputational, and regulatory incentives are to tackle this issue? Thanks so much for raising it. I think that's such a key question to raise in this, in, in this environment that we're in right now also. If you, you know, part of my job at Capital One is to say, okay, what are the big themes that we're kind of working through now? And so Emily Weems and I over in the corner for, for, the, for the Hill and for me for the regulators, we'll, we'll do sort of a road show and we'll say, here's sort of, the, here's sort of what we expect to come down uh, from the Hill and from regulators. And you know, one thing that we, kind of overarching theme that we raised is this focus on inclusion. Um, now it's terribly important for all the reasons that we discussed before, right? It's, it's, it's important to consumers, it's important because it's also good business, um, but I'd also note that it, it is an important regulatory policy issue for us as we think about the role that banks will play in our economy moving forward, right? So it was striking to me that in this conference, of all conferences, where we haven't been together in three years or so, the first panel, was about cryptocurrencies and central bank issue, central bank issue digital, digital currencies and the role that the banks would play in that space, right? It's striking to me that we have had two recent comptrollers of the currency nominees that advocated for alternatives to banks in the form of either uh, CBDCs, Fed uh, uh, direct to consumer accounts, or even post offices, right? But that's the world that we're in, that there's a concern, there's this perception that there's something so fundamentally wrong with the banking sector that we're so out of touch that you have places like the New York Times calling for alternatives, like full-on alternatives to banking, like not even trying to fix banking, but a full-on alternative to banking, um, where they're embracing things like a 95% rate of fraud into the, not, not just, well, where we have a system where, again, 19 out of the top 20 fraudsters would be non-banks, right? And so, like, how do we then, like, like navigate that environment? I mean, a big part of that is just to talk about the good work that we already do in financial inclusion, right? Like the CFPB's credit and visible support has shown that there's no better access to becoming credit visible than credit cards. Aaron and I love to, like he knows, like he can trigger me by, by any mention of interchange, right? But like, but we believe very strongly at Capital One about the ability to bring consumers into the ecosystem with a, like what we call our Main Street cards, but then grow with them as they then kind of, because that credit card then gives them the ability to then get an auto loan, to qualify for a mortgage, to kind of go along with them. So I'm not even talking about changing the way like we or you do banking. It's just wearing that on our sleeves, like helping policymakers understand that we have embraced this as a policy, helping the general public understand that, and not quite frankly, like not letting non-banks own this messaging in ways that they don't deserve. Um, so in my mind, like, I think that cuts across so many, like whenever we think about like, the existential issues that we've got in the policy space, so many of them are kind of adversaries or counterparties that have claimed that messaging that is rightfully ours. And so kind of my message today is that we should be getting that and wearing that for us. So Kelvin has taken us a bit to the solutions conversation. Some of it is communicating uh, what, what's going on and what the pathways are. David, do you want to talk about other um, avenues and some of the work that you're doing with Bank sure. On? Sure, so um, you know, when BankOn started about 10 years ago now, the, the idea was to create a national effort that was harnessing what was going on locally in communities. That there were a lot of uh, cities and counties who, who valued the, the concept of facilitating 
safe and affordable bank accounts. But really, those were mostly public relations efforts. You know, there was no teeth to them. It was, you know, people, you know, I think the FDIC came out with their, their now biannual report, and it showed double digit percentage of households, you know, not having a bank account. And that spooked people into, into really coming to action. But the, the solutions were basically the same accounts that were already out there. They had overdraft, minimum balance fees, you know, it was hard to get into them. And so what Bank On did was it, we, with an advisory group, um, we put together a set of national account standards that financial institutions could either uh, redefine their existing checking account or create a new checking account to meet. And those included things like not having overdraft fees or NSF fees, um, a minimum opening deposit of $25 or less, um, and you know, really focusing on the cost issue as well. So these accounts are all $5 a month as a maintenance fee or less. So we, we have a broad spectrum of those offerings. And the, you know, the point was really to get people into these accounts, um, show that they can be both popular and profitable at the same time, and you know, not a risk to financial institutions because it was really hard to go negative on these accounts. You know, most of these accounts were checklist checking accounts. So they were, you know, uh, the primary driver was a, a debit card. The, um, there were no paper checks. You couldn't post date a check that you didn't have money in the account for. Um, but people had ATM access. They had access to branches. Um, and so what started out as the four largest uh, banks in the country offering these accounts, we have um, 270 current financial institutions offering a uh, bank on certified account, which is really exciting. It occupies about 52% uh, of all financial institution branches across the country um, that offer some kind of a bank on certified account. Um, the other piece is we were really trying to connect in communities. So we also provide technical assistance and help to about 100 local bank on coalitions. Some of them are at the city level, some of them are state coalitions, and they're really the marketing arm um, and the policy arm to get people into these accounts. Um, it's great for you know, a, a financial institution to offer a bank on certified account, put it on their website, whatever, but what really drives it are when we connect them to places where people are getting paid or reimbursed or find themselves in you know, needing to pay bills. So um, we work really hard with uh, the FDIC and IRS during the stimulus payment drive to, to really get people to open accounts and then enter that account information um, in the IRS website so that their stimulus payments went direct deposit uh, into their bank accounts. Um, we worked with several states during um, uh, the PUA unemployment compensation payment drive to get people to have bank on certified accounts um, to get paid there. So those are like the, the program connections that work really well because as much as we like to see one person go into a branch and open these accounts, financial institutions get really excited about this when there's a pipeline, right? So when they, when they can see dozens of people you know, a week from a particular program opening these accounts. And that's, that's the drive for Bank On. Um, and so and, um, Aaron should talk a little bit about the success of, and some of the challenges of the stimulus payment parts. So I guess I, I would say, because I'm cognizant of, I'm, every single institution should have a Bank On account. I wish Congress would mandate it. I think Citibank, one out of five new accounts, has been a bank, their version of bank on. I don't see why that should be a target, right? Having an account that's a secret self thing in the back room that you have to say six code words to doesn't count, right? You gotta measure by how many of these accounts you move. Every one of you should have a bank on account. It should be required for all institutions. <coughs> Capital One did a great job in giving people access to their paycheck two days ahead of time. Direct deposit is slow and ancient. It is not direct. We know that, the American public doesn't. They also change their overdraft fee pricing. I challenge every institution here to do the same. And the Treasury Department, stop using Fed ACH. <laughs> I mean, if you guys were running movies and the Fed was blockbuster, we'd be driving to Alaska to get the last thing. Use this, you, you, nobody makes more payments in America than the Treasury Department. And using the Fed's antiquated system, whenever Fed later comes into play, you know, hopefully my, my, my kid will, will be, you know, somewhat alive to, to see it. The Bank of England did it in 18 months. I'm just meeting with the European Parliament good, Commissioner. Good Lord, Europe integrated 19 different folk. I know you're not, the Fed is an independent entity, um, but stop using the Fed ACH. Just stop it. it does, it's slow and antiquated. All these stimulus payments sat for days. 
when people were hungry and starving because of the, the slavish use of an antiquated system. And banks took the hit. Like we took the reputational hit. You did. And by the way, and, and, and some, some banks and some fintechs funded their money, right? Because the information went out for the payment. I want to get nerdy on payments on April 10th. The money wasn't supposed to be released till April 15th, and how did people eat over those five days? Right? One in four Americans were reporting child their, their children didn't have enough food. Right? And so, you know, there are solutions out there. Better, faster payment systems do exist. Let's use them. So I want to welcome questions from the audience. If you have questions for this distinguished and spirited panel, <laughs> feel, feel free to lob them in. And I'd, I'd welcome those questions. In the meantime, because I haven't seen any yet on my laptop, so I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that in, in a second. I just want to make sure that I'm not missing the opportunity to have any other uh, solution-oriented uh, comments that, that anybody wants to make. I see we do have some hands out there. And I was told I was supposed to be looking at this for my questions, but because it's blank in their hands, we may have to do it the old-fashioned way, like the Bank of England. So uh, if, if, if you very quickly want to, want to um, if anybody has any other solution things, if not, I've seen a couple of hands and we can grab those. Kelvin, do you? Well, just one thing. Right. So the CFPB was brought in to ostensibly create parity from a consumer protection perspective between banks and non-banks. We can set us in. There's another, there's another panel that I think Tom is on this at by tomorrow. That we'll talk about kind of how well they've done that in terms of their priorities in this administration. I, I will note, though, that that's just the beginning, right? Like, as we're starting to see the scale at which non-banks can come in play, particularly with respect to some of like the non-bank lenders that are coming in with uh, a huge scale given the devices that we have in our pockets, there are other types of regs we need to start thinking about, right? Like, like we've seen safety and soundness risks from what some of these crypto banks fall apart. Like, there's a question as to whether or not we're entering into financial stability. Parity questions with respect to banks and non-banks. I don't think we really have the vocabulary for that. I mean, thankfully, Michael Sue is talking about some of this with the regulatory perimeter of the OCC. But these are really big, important questions. And we're, we're kind of walking through one-way doors right now. Um, and this is something where we, I think, as an industry, but as we think about policy and what's kind of good for the earth, not just what's good for banking, like really need to be thinking about what that parity should look like. Thank you for that. I think the gentleman right here had a question. And then there, there's a mic coming so that people can hear your question. Just a quick question. You've done this for quite a while now. Are you keeping track of the economic progress of the people who are getting access to those accounts in the first instance? In other words, how have they progressed? The same question I get the bank on. Are you keeping data on how their economic life has improved? So I mean, I'll start. I mean, our bank, our bank on accounts are our flagship product. Like our, I'm looking at Andy just to verify. Like this is, yeah, it's it's that is our checking account product. And so I mean, we certainly keep tabs on them. But then it's because they are our customer. Great. I think. Sorry. Quick follow up. I think Jerry's saying that he thinks somebody needs to fund a double blind. Study with a control group, preferably done by a large Washington think tank, <laughs> <laughs> uh, to, to, to look at to look at the marginal improvement. But what marginal improvements do you guys? Yeah, I mean, so we uh, the data that we have, um, and we have a great partner partner in the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, is all account related data. So it's aggregated for each financial institution that's part of Bank On that wants to submit the data. Um, what that data shows, it gives us stuff like the average deposit per account. Um, what the balances look like, um, you know, how they're using the account. So it's about the health of the bank on movement. Not we, we don't have anything and are unable to do something at the individual level of account. Similarly, we've been, uh, and I, I, I know that this will be appreciated in this room, that we've been very nervous about asking for sort of cross-markets, cross-marketing product stuff inside banks. You know, um, it's a it's touchy, right? So we, do, you know, we're nervous to sort of get into, you know, okay, well, how many of these people are you now getting credit cards and things like that? It's, I, I think it's um, it's important to know, but we, we haven't done it yet. No. Great. Sounds like Aaron's ready to do it though. Um, I want I want to take probably two more questions from the floor. I'm just looking at the clock, so we'll take the questions and then we'll take the answers together. Uh, yeah, that's you. Hold 
hold your answers for a second. I think there was one more question. Uh, it's more common. Anyone? Roger. The KYC issue from onboarding to be unbanked, I mean, that's a real issue in face of regulation. Any ideas in terms of how we can avoid the you know, permanent address, for instance, uh, so we could get that fundamental requirement satisfied? Very good. So CheckX, right, isn't about, I mean, CheckX is used as a shortcut for AML compliance, although A has really nothing to do with B. Right? People don't end up on the CheckX system because there's some concern that they're money laundering. Right? That's not what drove them to end up on CheckX. Right? So we have an AML system that's like on autopilot of insanity. Right? And you know, I think there's some, some leadership at Treasury and some, some other good folks that want to try and address this situation, but it's been very challenging to rein in in large part. I mean, you know, you, you still have a $10,000 threshold. Right? When that $10,000 threshold was put in, you could have bought, uh, a, you could have paid for an entire year of tuition at Harvard in cash and not triggered an AML perspective. Right now, now that the dollar amount for debt forgiveness is, would, would trigger a, a CTR, <laughs> right? And, and the SARS and, and all the rest. So I mean, I think you need a fundamental rethink that would start with what are we after, right? Because we're filing SARS <coughs> on you know, all sorts of crazy stuff. And it would be nice to see a fundamental rethink. In the absence of that, in the interim, I, I don't know what blessed thing Dave, David may have more. Well, for some of the know your yeah, I mean, some of the know your customer pieces are, I think, just regulators and, and examiners and, and financial institutions. Kind of, um, you know, I, I have young kids, and so they they love these, um, you know, the Facebook and, and other kinds of memes. You know that famous one where the two Spiderman people are pointing at each other. That's kind of what it seems like with banks and, and their examiners and know your customer, which is, well, we, what, what constitutes a permanent address? And then the examiner says, well, you know, what do you think constitutes a permanent address? And, and it's back and forth. And, but, but really, if you read, if you read the regs, you, know, you can use a you know, grandparent, a parent. There, there's, there's a lot there that is just not discussed and, and looked into. And I think that definitely clarity from, from some of the regulators would be more helpful. But also financial institutions, you know, pushing pushing their regulators to tell them and give them more, you know, more leeway on ID and um, and address and and specifically on address. I mean, that's that's a really big one. Especially, we've done some um, some work with coalitions in the community who are banking homeless individuals, and you know, some of them have found that they can use an administrative address of the service center where people are, you know, um, not where they're physically living, but where they're being like helped in the, the work that's being processed. So, so I just want to go back to that data question. Yeah, and this is because, the last word. Because I wasn't entirely sure what you meant by security or insecurity. If you mean like the bank's ability to use their own data, which is how much money's in your bank account to make a loan. I just saw that news from Citibank about their operation reach lending. Hallelujah, anything that can junk FICO is better and more efficient and the regulators need to let banks do that. If your question is that people aren't going to banks because they're concerned that their data is going to get breached. No, no, data and security is actually related to the KYC problem. If you don't have a quorum of data, that actually qualifies you for an account or lending, that's actually an important factor to financial security. I don't have a credit history. I'm 25. I don't have a credit history. Credit history. Yeah. Yeah. Credit history. Yeah. 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 Right. Okay. So th th this, this is why you know, Brad Pitt was right at the end of Fight Club, right? Remember what Brad Pitt blew up? It was a credit reporting agency, right? We need to move to cash <laughs> flow. We're, we're not advocating violence. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thanks for the questions. <laughs> and thanks for the wonderful panel. Janice, Kelvin, Aaron, and David. Thank you very much.